Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Sustainable Development Impact Summit session, Fast Forward to Frontier Technologies. To get the most out of this virtual session, please take a moment to check your setup, make sure you're connected to high quality Wi-Fi, 4G, or uh, uh, you know, land connection. Uh, connect your device to a charger to make sure you don't run out of battery uh, partway through. And please, before you start speaking, just check that your camera and your microphone are turned on. When you're finished, we ask that you mute your microphone. Also, please note that we're recording today's session, although any breakout rooms we enter won't be recorded. And the first half of today's session will be live, live streamed on the forum website. As we get started, for those joining us on Zoom, please feel free to use the chat box, introduce yourself and ask comments or questions. For those joining us on live stream, welcome. And with that, I'll hand it off to our session moderator, Florence Godry Perkins, founder and CEO of Digital Health Partnerships. Hello, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. Welcome to this exciting session on Frontier Technologies. Uh, my name is Florence Godry Perkins, and I'm really thrilled to be moderating um, this conversation where we're going to explore forward innovations and how they relate to solving major social and environmental challenges. My particular area of focus um, is digital technology to better access health, especially in lower and middle income countries. I, in fact, pushed um, Alcatel Lucent and Nokia back in 2011 into a social innovation shared value strategy to use ICT technologies um, to achieve SDGs. So this is a subject that's very dear to my heart. Um, we have with us today four outstanding experts um, who will take us into the realm of select technologies that they're working on and how those can bring us closer to a sustainable future. Uh, one question that we're going to want to bear in mind um, as we move into the discussion, uh, and this will be especially relevant in the breakout groups that we'll also have, is how do we keep in check also unintended consequences of some of these advances that we um, that are you know quite astounding some of them um, that you are going to hear about um, all the frontier technologies in general can make uh, sustainable development a reality such as improving people's lives people's lives promoting prosperity or protecting the planet the rapid pace at which they're happening may also introduce sometimes some serious policy uh, challenges um, they can potentially widen inequalities. They can also introduce new ethical dilemmas. Um, there is probably no better, uh, more current example right now than our social media platforms, which have created absolutely amazing opportunities for the world, but have also had some unintended consequences. Um, so the way that this session will um, flow is that we are first going to have an approximately 40 minute conversation with our four speakers here. And then we'll move into 20 minute breakout sessions, which will be led um, by our four speakers. Um, one will be on the role of space technology and climate action. The other on probiotic production process to sustainably feed the future and that will be led by Lisa and then the data on artificial intelligence transforming agriculture will be the third breakout and then we'll have quantum computing uh, being the fourth um, the fourth one before um, we um, and after these breakout sessions, uh, what we'll do, which they will last about 20 minutes, we'll reconvene and there will be um, a sort of reporting back on some of the things that you've discussed. So these breakout sessions are a chance for the audience to interact further with the uh, panelists um, and, uh, and to engage with them. And so we would then report back and, uh, and then make some, some conclusions on the session. Um, the logistics, before I go and remind everyone on some logistics questions, um, we would love for the audience to take a little poll, um, which should in principle pop up on your screen there. Um, 
And the question that we'd love for everyone to answer is what technology are you um, the most excited about for advancing the sustainable development goals? Um, so you'll see on the screen that you have um, space, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, probiotic production process to sustainability feed the future or 3D printing um, and other. So if you can take a few minutes to um, fill that out, um, and just uh, as a reminder, and I think um, we were reminded of that earlier to make sure that you stay uh, on mute, um, that if you wish to speak, um, and this will be especially, especially relevant during the breakout sessions, of course, when there will be interaction, is if you can just click on the icon at the bottom of your screen um, and raise the hand button um, so that the, the uh, moderator of the breakout session is aware that you're trying to, uh, to speak. The session is not being recorded, but notes will be taken and distributed. And I don't know, Ruth, if we're going to have the results of the poll right away, or we are. Look how efficient. So we have artificial intelligence. Um, it looks like is the one everyone here uh, in the audience is the most excited about. In the second, we have the probiotic production process, which is one of the things, of course, we're going to be speaking about today. Um, it's a very exciting field indeed. And then we have um, space. Ms. Simonote will be speaking to us about that. And then, uh, and then comes synthetic biology and uh, um, 3D printing which is one of the, not one of the subjects we'll be broaching today. So thanks very much for that. So let me um, now introduce um, our experts and speakers so we can get to know them a little bit uh, before we find out more about their technologies. Um, Simonetta, I would love to start with you. Um, you are the director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, um, and you're gonna speak to us on the role of space technology and climate action. Can you just briefly introduce yourself, just you know, a minute, a couple of minutes, and, and also what drives your, your work and thinking? The floor is yours, Simonetta. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, can, can, perhaps. Yeah, can you, yeah, can you hear me? Can That's you okay. hear me? Can you hear yeah, you? great, great. No, so I can no, hear you uh, very well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as we say in, in space, loud and clear. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for <laughs> allowing me to be part of this interesting uh, panel discussion. And I'm very uh, pleased to, to be with you and also to get to know uh, people uh, working, uh, top level people working in other fields, uh, which can be also relevant for the activities we do in space. So my point is that uh, I, I always been a space person. So I'm an astrophysicist by education. I've been working all my uh, professional career in the, in the field, uh, first at national level in my home country, then at regional level at the European uh, Space Agency. I've been in Brussels for a couple of years. And then uh, since uh, now March 2014, I'm the director of the Office for Outer Space Affairs at the United Nations. Nations, which is an office of the secretariat, which means that we report to the General Assembly. And so we serve the 193 member states of the United Nations. And the main uh, mandate, the main goal of our activities is to bring the benefits of space, space-based data, infrastructure, services, and applications to everyone everywhere, trying to bridge what we call the space divide, which is the difference between the countries uh, uh, which have already, which are mastering already uh, space technologies for the benefit of their own citizens, and the countries which are emerging or developing in this field and trying to catch up and trying to really use space at the maximum extent possible to for sustainable development. So overall, uh, it's it's quite an interesting, uh, let's say, activity because it's the social side of. Uh, of space, how we can really use the infrastructures available and, uh, and data available for the benefit of everyone. So it just really in a, in a, in a nutshell, um, my, my professional career and uh, what we do 
at the UN in space. And thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Simonetta, for, for this brief introduction. I can't help, um, you know, sort of underlying though, because this is a fairly unique, uh, unique um, piece of information is that you actually have an asteroid named after you. Um, I was reading in, uh, in some information on you, and this was in honor of your contribution to space um, exploration. Uh, yeah, there's an asteroid called Di Pipo uh, that was named by the International Astronomical Union. So I think it's a pretty unique feature that I, I wanted to underline. <laughs> so it's an honor to have us with you, Simonetta. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. Um, yeah. Um, I'd like to now turn to Dr. Lisa Dyson. Um, she is the founder and chief executive officer um, of Air Protein, and she's joining us from uh, California today. And she's going to speak to us about probiotic production process to sustainably feed the future. It's absolutely fascinating, as you'll see. Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about um, who you are and your background and, and what has been driving you also? Yes, absolutely. So wonderful to be here with, with all of you. Thank you so much for, for that intro. And yes, my name is Lisa Dyson. I am a scientist by training. My PhD is in physics from MIT. I did research at a few different institutions, including Stanford and UC Berkeley before transitioning into the business world, uh, where I worked at the Boston Consulting Group for a number of years helping executives solve business problems. And what I was missing in my life was impact. And I really began focusing on climate change as an issue uh, after going to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina hit and just really seeing the devastation there. Um, you know, people were essentially refugees uh, leaving their homes and trying to find shelter elsewhere. You know, people lost their lives. The community was very much in shambles. And I began thinking years later about science and kind of my background as a scientist and climate science in particular. Uh, and, and my question was, how can, how can technology be a part of the solution? And also my background in business really taught me that one place where we could scale technologies is through business. And so I started a company called Kiverti, really focused on taking carbon dioxide and using it as a building block for products to make everything from oils to biodegradable packaging material uh, and ultimately proteins. Uh, and so I started Air Protein really as a focus on the food industry specifically. Uh, and the food industry, as we know, is one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, emitting more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector. So if you really wanna have an impact on climate change, one of the areas where we really need to focus is food. So we developed a technology, a way of taking carbon dioxide as a fundamental building block, an element of the air that we're breathing right now, and using that as a building block to make nutritious proteins. And so air protein is really on a mission to redefine meat and how meat is made. Of course, one of the, the largest greenhouse emitting sectors and make it in a way that uses significantly less land, uh, significantly less water and uses carbon dioxide as a building block instead of uh, making, producing lots of greenhouse gases along the way. So we make meat from elements of the air at Air Protein. And I'm excited to be one of the group of companies that is making the meat industry specifically more sustainable and food in general more sustainable. Yeah, extremely impressive. Thank you. We look uh, very much look forward to hearing more uh, about this. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, I just like to add that um, uh, Dr. Dyson, you are you know very brilliant, and and, and, um, and you've you've received for this uh, many many awards and too many for me to cite here. But I would just uh, cite the latest one, which uh, you were. Um, ranked as the, one of the top 100 female founders of 2019 by Inc. Magazine. So really a, a great honor to have us, um, to have you with us as, as well today um, and sharing your time and expertise with us. Um, I'd like to, go ahead. Did you want to, yeah. um, I'd like to now turn, turn to Danielle um, Copo. And Danielle is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Prospera Technologies. Um, Prospera was founded uh, uh, in Israel, and he is going to speak to us of data and artificial intelligence transforming agriculture. He's uh, usually based uh, close to Palo Alto, but um, but no, in fact, yes, he is joining us uh, from there today. Um, Danielle, can you kindly say a few words about yourself as well, so the audience uh, knows you a bit better before we move into um, what you do? Sure, yeah, and uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me today and great great to be here. 
um, and honored to be with some of these uh, incredible uh, panelists. Um, I, uh, uh, as you mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders um, and CEO of uh, Prospera Technologies, uh, an AI company focused on, on how to optimize uh, the agriculture industry. Um, I come from a, a software background from a very, very young age. Um, then uh, I worked for different uh, intelligence units uh, in, in Israel, followed by uh, working for different startups uh, in many various domains. Um, I did a little bit of management consulting where I found that uh, big impact um, probably needs to come from new innovations um, and set off with um, a few friends from university um, to uh, figure out how we can help uh, some of the growers in the world close the gaps between the technology available and the, the technology that is out in the field. Uh, we actually got into agriculture completely by accident, and I like to call it uh, a process of falling in love with an incredible industry, uh, given we do not come uh, from an agriculture, uh, agriculture background. Uh, actually positioning us quite uniquely in, in, in this uh, today's, uh, what is today uh, called uh, ag tech, agriculture technology domain, um, mostly uh, coming from uh, mo most companies and uh, innovation coming from um, companies that actually come from agriculture or, or agronomy. We as outsiders uh, come from a machine learning uh, background. And uh, I think that creates a lot of um, interesting questions for us. So we try to formalize um, a lot of uh, challenges and problems um, that happen in this domain. Um, today, we, uh, as a company, look at multiple uh, data sets, uh, including uh, satellite and, and information coming from space, but all the way down to um, imagery coming from the field um, and try and help uh, farmers globally um, with uh, reducing the amount of uh, chemicals uh, that they use, uh, reducing the amount of uh, water and fertilizer and ultimately becoming to be more profitable uh, business. Um, and um, we work today um, uh, mainly in the US, Mexico um, and Latin America in general um, and company, um, as, as you mentioned, Forrest is based uh, out of Tel Aviv and I'm based here in California together with a, a team that we have in the Midwest. So thanks very much for having me today. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and I would then very much uh, like to introduce Jeremy O'Brien, who is um, our first speaker and is the Chief Executive Officer of C Quantum, also based out of the USA. And he's going to talk to us about quantum computing um, and its possible implication on sustainable development. Uh, Jeremy, can you also in turn tell us more about you and what has driven you to your activity today? Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Florence. So yes, I'm, I'm one of the uh, co-founders and the CEO of uh, SciQuantum. And I'm also um, one of the co-chairs of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Quantum Computing. Um, I first learned about uh, the promise of quantum computing uh, back in 1995. And I immediately understood that this technology will ultimately be nothing short of a necessary tool for humans to invent our future. And uh, consequently, I've been working on bringing quantum computing into reality ever since. Um, for 20 years as a uh, professor of physics and electrical engineering, and for the last five years as uh, CEO of, of SciQuantum. But until recently, uh, I've been very hesitant to talk about quantum computing uh, in the context of the SDGs uh, and not, not because I didn't believe that quantum computing uh, would have a profound impact in these critical areas. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't believe there's a more uh, positively world-changing technology uh, out there or on the horizon, I think across agriculture, healthcare, energy uh, and climate uh, quantum computing will be the most profoundly world-changing technology that we've uncovered to date. But I was hesitant uh, because I wasn't sure we were going to get there quickly enough to have a substantial impact by the 2030 uh, delivery date for the SDGs. And I'm now convinced that we will. And I'd, I'd love to share some more with you. 
Lovely. Thank you so much, Jeremy. We look forward to hearing, hearing more about all of this. Um, I'd like to turn back um, to you, Simonetta, now. Let's, um, let's find out more about each one of your frontier technologies. So can you tell us uh, more about the role of space technology in climate action, Simonetta? Yeah, so uh, for sure, it, in, in a nutshell, what I can say is that uh, in, in, the, in the last 60 years, which is the time that we measured in, since the launch of the first satellite in orbit, in reality, space uh, has become a sort of a game changer in many fields in our everyday life, uh, in the way in which we can address global challenges, including climate change, um, is extremely uh, is an extremely powerful tool, and in reality, space really contributes to our understanding of the planet. But in, in particular, is also able to allow us to monitor the the situation, and not only in climate change, but for a lot of different uh, in a lot of different fields. Well, recently, more or less a couple of years ago, we conducted a study combining. Uh, Earth observation data and uh, in global navigation satellite systems, so precise navigation and location, and uh, and we found and we analyzed the 169 targets underpinning the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are, let's say, the the backbone of the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and uh, in a very conservative manner. So we are we have been very very conservative. What we have been doing is um, through this analysis, we found that as a minimum 40%, 40% of the SDGs uh, can only be achieved uh, through the use of space, the use of space. So there is no possibility of any decision making in the world or any possibility to fulfill for any country in the world, the, uh, the goals contained in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development without space. Now, I'm personally fully convinced that if we add also the, 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 uh, the third dimension of space technologies, which is telecommunication, we combine that, we include also high resolution images. Well, we uh, easily go beyond 50%. Even if 40% is already a huge number, well, you can imagine that uh, the more we go up, the more it means that space is really mandatory for anyone in the world to be, the, I mean, to be part of any policy and decision making. Um, and this is true for developed uh, countries, but also for developing and emerging countries, um, if you want even more. Well, we also, uh, if you want, uh, uh, what we do is also strongly linked to disaster risk reduction, in particular, we focus on the emergency response phase. So how to use space-based data and infrastructures to support the member states of the United Nations in their, in their way of managing um, disasters. Now, disasters, um, natural disasters, in particular certain types of disasters, uh, are becoming more and more extreme and this is strongly linked to climate change. Uh, and so what is extremely important to notice is that uh, if we combine the effects of, um, of disasters and therefore the disaster linked to climate change with the pandemic and the issue that we had, the issues that with the challenges that we had to face recently and we continue to face with coronavirus, well, we see that there is a huge, uh, an exponential increase in, in, in the number of, for example, of infected people when you combine a natural disaster with the pandemic, which is also something that you can monitor in a way from space. And another extremely important element that, we, that I would like to underline is that uh, we count a little bit less than 60 essential climate variables, uh, which are the variables that are absolutely needed, absolutely mandatory to be monitored in order to understand um, which could be the future of, uh, of our climate and therefore being able not only to look at the adaptation and mitigation, but also trying to see what we can do to prevent a little bit uh, uh, the, uh, the situation to become worse and worse. And with satellites, uh, you can cover more than 50% 
of this ECB, essential climate variables. So without space, you cannot really monitor the impact and, and the, the, main, the main variables of uh, uh, related to climate change. Uh, in a nutshell, the point is that uh, even if um, space is perceived as something far away, because you know satellites are in orbit, so not exactly on, on Earth, still what we can do from space, and uh, there is also one important point that I would like to underline. Uh, the developed countries are able to uh, send in space a lot of satellites, constellations of satellites, and in most cases, the data are available free, uh, free of charge and in an open manner. So there is free and open access uh, from, uh, for a lot of satellites in orbit and for a lot of data available in orbit. And when this is not uh, possible, we, as the Office for Outer Space Affairs, we facilitate the connection between the various uh, stakeholders in order to support uh, countries which are more in need with the support of developing developed countries. So just to tell you that in reality, you don't need to have a satellite in orbit. Uh, if you are a given country, you don't need to have a, a satellite in orbit to benefit uh, from space if you have all the connections and the right approach to uh, to, to the use of, of uh, satellites, et cetera. So what we probably need to do is to, uh, on one side, to put back science at the center. And I believe the pandemic and climate and, and the issue with disasters is bringing us collectively to understand that science must be at the center, uh, science and technology, and space is a key tool for a sustainable development, but also a key tool for trying to tackle this important challenge for humanity, which as, as the Secretary General said just at the beginning, just opening the 75 uh, you know, edition of the General Assembly in a virtual mode, that this is not any more climate change, this is a climate crisis. Thank you very much, Simonetta. I think uh, that was very, very clear. And, uh, you know, being key, I, I worked for many years in um, the telecommunications industry more on the on the ground, you know, with, uh, with deploying uh, fiber and whatnot. And, um, you know, it, 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 there's no question that there's certain areas in the world that can only be reached um, via space and satellite. So that in itself is already extremely key. Um, thank you again. We'll, we'll come back to you so that we try to understand um, in the latter part of the conversation a little bit more so some of the challenges that you um, that you face. But for now, let's let's turn to Lisa. Um, and Lisa, we um, would love to understand more about this fascinating um, uh, process that you're working on. Um, can you? Can you tell us uh, more? I, what I wanted to underline is that the next technologies, whether it's Lisa or Danielle that are going to talk about it, talk about is that they're they're all, they're both going to talk about something related to food, and there's really no more fundamental need um, than food, and that's not about to go away or change. So these next two frontier technologies we're going to talk about are, are very important. Uh, the floor is yours, Lisa. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we call what we do a probiotic production process because it's similar to making yogurt or brewing beer or making cheese. Uh, and so what we start off with is elements of the air that we breathe, carbon dioxide and oxygen. And then we're able to use this probiotic production process to make a really nutritious protein. And the work that we're doing is inspired by work done by NASA during the space program, during the 60s and 70s, where they asked the question, how can we feed astronauts uh, on long space journeys to Mars and distant planets? Uh, and that's the same question as how do you recycle carbon essentially, because we're a carbon-based life form and we get our carbon through our food and we need carbon to survive. And once you leave the planet with a certain amount of carbon, you can't pick up any more along the way. So you have to figure out how to recycle it. And they were really thinking about astronauts are breathing out carbon dioxide. How can we capture that and then use that as an input to the food that they're eating? And so we've developed this way of, of using something again, like making yogurt uh, that has uh, carbon dioxide as a core fund feedstock, a core building block and oxygen and other elements of the air. You, we use renewable power uh, as well to ultimately create a protein flour and that protein flour then can then uh, be turned into meat using culinary techniques like temperature 
and pressure. Think of making pasta from, from wheat flour, similar type of concept, um, but we're really focused on make, creating the textures uh, that you get when you're biting into a steak or a chicken breast, uh, as well as the flavors that you get. And so we're a part of a movement. So veggie burgers and veggie foods have been around for a long time. And I myself started eating them two decades ago. And really when I converted to become a vegetarian. But the question is, how do you appeal to the broader populations out there that love pork, that love steak, and they're really not changing their, their, their habits. They don't want to, it's very difficult for them to. Uh, and so I'm one of the group of companies that are really looking at how do you then define meat in a more broad way, define it as what you end up with uh, on the plate versus what it comes from, define it as the textures and flavors that you're used to and that you love versus in the case of, a, of steak, taking two years to make that steak. So right now the current technology that we use to make steak takes two years and lots of land, lots of water, and lots of greenhouse gases are emitted along the way. So it's very old technology and it's ripe for disruption. Uh, and so, you know, we're focused on how do you not make take two years to make steak, but instead just four days. And how do you do that using significantly less land and water uh, as inputs in order to make that, to give uh, people the, the textures and the flavors that they're looking for when they're biting into a steak. Uh, so that's kind of the core of the technology and the impact. You know, what we're really focused on is, is, you know, by 2050, we have to feed 10 billion people. And how do we do that in a way that doesn't emit massive amounts of greenhouse gases, that doesn't use all the land that we use? Right now, the current food production system there's been a, an area that's been cleared for that. That's the size of South America and Africa combined. Just look at last year, there were record fires in Brazil. And a lot of that was to make room for cattle grazing. Uh, and so how, do we, how are we gonna feed 10 billion people by 2050 if this is already the amount of land that's been cleared for our current food production process? So we're really looking for solutions and developing one of the solutions for that, a way that uh, takes significantly less land uh, and, and by comparison, it would take a soy farm the size of Texas to give you the same amount of protein that you get from an air protein farm the size of Walt Disney World. So significant land reduction, water reduction, and using CO2 as a building block versus emitting lots of greenhouse gases. Wonderful. Um, it's, it's fascinating. And of course, the, the impacts um, on, on just even the environment that you just mentioned sounds so stupendous. I was reading that um, there is an, also an expectation of, of consumption. I don't know how recent, of course, uh, the number is probably not so recent, but there was an expectation that animal protein was expected to be to increase in consumption. Um, by 70% from like 2007 to 2030. And this indeed sounds not very sustainable at all in view of the problems that we face with climate change today. So your, you know, sort of uh, frontier technology here is um, extremely opportune, of course, um, in face of the challenges that we face. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you um, also, Lisa, to understand some of the challenges that you face and to understand a little bit better where you stand in the process also. I'd love to know more about that, but let's, uh, let's first perhaps ask Danielle um, to tell us a little bit more about um, AI and data um, and how that improves agriculture. Can you tell us more about this, um, this um, what Prospera does um, so that we the audience understands better sort of the concrete applications and, and the impact that it can have on a more sustainable world. Sure, yeah. Um, and I think it's a great follow-up to some of the um, uh, interesting comments Lisa had. I think we're, we're tackling very, very similar uh, problems in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really, yes, we, we need to, as, as humanity, we need to, to feed a, a growing population in a much more efficient way. Um, and I think one of the, um, you know, the, the area we're focusing on is taking this current system that is built um, and uh, seeing how we can make it more efficient. Agriculture is uh, one of the, if not the largest uh, industry in the world. Um, it is GDPs of countries. It is, it is, it is really, um, I think everyone here realizes um, it's, a, it's a very huge industry, both financially, but then also um, in terms of um, the land it takes. And uh, we're looking to see how we can make um, every single piece of land more efficient, which is uh, going to be a necessity for, for, for humanity. 
Um, if you think of agriculture in, in a macro spec, uh, we've been growing as humans food for the last 10,000 years. And really, uh, uh, if you look at the potential per uh, acre or any unit of land, it's been quite stagnant for those 10,000 years. And uh, 100 years ago, more or less, uh, new innovation came in. Uh, we had uh, mechanization. So we had uh, tractors and combines and different uh, pieces of equipment. And we had smarter irrigation and the introduction of, of, uh, of uh, genetics and understanding how to um, breed uh, uh, seeds uh, or plants and, and, and new chemicals. Um, and ultimately, um, the uh, manufacturing function in this value chain, the, the, the function that takes this, uh, these different inputs of, of, of seed and chemical and fertilizer and uh, a piece of land and produces an output of, of, of produce, uh, whether it's grain or, or uh, fruit or vegetable, uh, th that piece really uh, and now is overwhelmed with uh, lots of information uh, with a with a very big, big big you know very difficult task. So when you think of growers globally, and it, this 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 uh, this is uh, relevant to both uh, developing countries as uh, um, you know uh, more advanced countries, um, the practice of growing is quite complex. Um, there are many, many questions of uh, how to irrigate, how to fertilize, how to spray. These are very difficult questions. Um, and um, what we find is that the uh, production is extremely suboptimal. So when we look at um, how much yield potential you can get from seed, or if you would imagine uh, and, and, and simulate a optimal growing environment, we are extremely far away. So one area to handle is create new genetics and seeds to, to improve productivity. But another is to um, help uh, you know, growers globally with making better decisions um, in terms of the day-to-day -day activities in the field. And these namely include how to irrigate, how to fertilize, and as I mentioned, how to spray. Um, and Prospera as a company, uh, together with um, other initiatives in, in the industry, looks at how we can uh, take data and uh, help with those decisions that today are more or less based, uh, more or less made based on intuition and uh, um, I, would, I would say less a scientific in a less scientific based approach. Um, and our approach as a company is looking at um, the most scalable uh, data acquisition methods out there. So uh, from our perspective, um, if you would uh, look at a field, uh, whether it's uh, in a greenhouse or, or in the open fields and uh, have a camera on every single plant and have a soil probe on every single plant and have a climate station and have just lots and lots of data for uh, most of us, we would say, yes, probably with all that information and computational powers, um, we'd be able to produce more yields than just having no data at all and no uh, interpretation capabilities. Um, but uh, by doing uh, what I just mentioned, you would be losing a lot of money on that field, um, uh, deploying that mm -hmm. amount of technology. So as a company, we look at scalable data sets and see how can we take something that we can use globally um, and help with improving that yield in a cost efficient way. So. Um, we look at uh, data from satellites, as Simonetta mentioned. So we actually take that application and see how can we use that data to, to, to help um, farmers and growers. Uh, but then we also look at imagery coming from uh, drones and irrigation systems. And really uh, our angle is to look and be hardware and sensor agnostic. So we could look at multiple um, types of data, mainly focusing on imagery and computer vision technologies within uh, the domain of AI, artificial intelligence, and help growers with detecting um, insects and pests from an image, uh, stressed areas to help them with making irrigation more efficient, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in turn, build uh, extremely scalable solutions. So just as one example, we partnered with the largest um, irrigation company in the world. So this company has hundreds of thousands of uh, Pivots, which is uh, uh, one of the most scalable irrigation methods uh, in the world globally. And we take the, the data coming from uh, these pivots, combining it with satellite imagery 
and are able to tell growers how to improve um, the way they irrigate and, uh, you know, finding that they can reduce uh, as much as 20 or 30% in the amount of water and fertilizer they're using and still achieve higher yields. Uh, so when we think about sustainability, this is uh, a key factor uh, for growing at scale using less inputs and achieving higher yields. I love it. Thank you very much. Very exciting as well, Daniel. And um, um, I see the time is ticking and I would just die to ask more questions, but uh, maybe uh, during the breakout groups, um, you'll manage uh, to dwell into it. One, one of the you know questions, um, not that we have time to really address it here, because I'd, I'd like to also give the floor um, to Jeremy, is, um, and I read somewhere, and again, don't quote me on it, but that 70% sort of ag agriculture production is actually by small farms, mostly in lower and middle income countries. So uh, I would be you know, super curious, of course, on you know, how you plan um, to address that, whether you already have and whatnot. I think I read somewhere that you had moved into Mexico um, and I'm sure that probably there's, um, you know, there are things there, but perhaps again, we'll come back, um, you know, hopefully we'll have time to talk at least uh, uh, about a few challenges here before moving into the breakout groups and otherwise we'll go into it uh, during the breakouts. Um, Jeremy, let's, let's turn to you. Um, and you know, your field is, um, you know, I, I, to me is completely, well, fascinating and complex to, uh, to understand. Um, and, and it promises basically, I mean, if we take it very high level for someone like me who's not an engineer, um, quantum promises to do in minutes what modern supercomputers, you know, would take decades or centuries to, uh, to complete. So um, can you tell us about your work, what you do at C Quantum in, in simple words and, and what you see, you know, try to, you know, perhaps also what you see as the most powerful future use cases really um, that can be shared equitably across the world, hopefully. Your floor is, your, floor is yours. Thank you, Jeremy. Sure. Thanks, Florence. In fact, um, uh, you know, a, a quantum computer will be able to do things in, in minutes that um, a, you know, a conventional computer uh, would take billions of years to do. So it's really redefining what's possible. Um, and so it's really taking problems that actually are forever otherwise impossible and making them possible. And that's the first thing I think really to understand about quantum computing is that there are, there are problems um, across all of science and technology that we will never solve on any conventional computer that we could ever build. And the reason that they're forever impossible is that they grow exponentially in the size of the problem. And so they just take a completely impractical amount of time. Um, as I say, these problems span uh, all of science and technology and thereby uh, underpin uh, pretty well uh, all of human activity. And I think for the purposes of this discussion, it's important to appreciate that were we able to solve some of these problems, we could have a very profound impact um, on a lot of the science and technology uh, that could be deployed uh, to tackle the, the SDGs. Now, I said in my introduction that I've been working on this, uh, on this problem for 25 years. So you might reasonably ask, well, where is it uh, given, given all this great promise? Um, and the challenge to, 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 uh, to realizing this technology is that you need around a million uh, quantum transistors or qubits in order to tackle all of these, uh, all of these problems uh, that I'm sketching for you here. It's been my conviction actually since last century, which makes me feel a little bit old to have to say that, but it's been my conviction that we won't have uh, quantum computing in my lifetime unless we figure out how to harness the existing semiconductor chip manufacturing capability that we have. Um, and of course, that, uh, that capability has you know, been, been the result of more than 50 years of development and a trillion dollars of investment. And, it, and it's really, in my view, uh, the culmination of, of human uh, technological achievement, what we can do uh, in terms of making silicon chips. And as of uh, last year, Cyquantum uh, is in the production line of a, 
a tier one semiconductor chip foundry, global foundries, um, which is what has, uh, has changed my uh, willingness to talk about uh, quantum computing in the context of SDGs, because we now have a, um, you know, we have now have clear sight of that uh, million qubit uh, quantum computing capability. And we're, you know, a handful of years away from, from delivering that. So now what keeps me up at night is not whether we can realize this technology or not in my lifetime, but how we're going to deploy this technology. And I'm determined that we deploy this uh, technology in, in priority because there will be a uh, substantial supply demand mismatch uh, initially. And I'm determined that we deploy it uh, to have the, the highest positive impact that we can. And the good news is that um, the SDGs provide guardrails for, for thinking about that. And as, as far as I have concluded, um, and I'd love to have uh, discussions with you all here uh, during, the, during the breakout, but I think the, uh, the priorities are climate, energy and healthcare in that order. And so on the uh, climate side of things uh, as the highest priority, I would say the prospects for designing um, you know, new clean energy devices, new materials for those devices, uh, more efficient batteries that could change the whole economics around uh, electrification, uh, new materials for uh, increased fuel efficiency, new fuels themselves, um, solving optimization problems, uh, new fertilizers and uh, that consume less energy in their production um, and you know, provide more sustainable ways to feed the, the population, uh, insulation materials, building materials, the list goes on. The one I'd like to focus on uh, just briefly now is uh, a catalyst uh, for carbon capture and use. So uh, as I think people here know, we need to suck many gigatons of carbon back out of the atmosphere in parallel with reducing our emissions to zero as quickly as possible. If we could design a catalyst that we could cheaply and easily produce uh, and deploy uh, to uh, turn that carbon into useful uh, products, and we've heard a lot of exciting examples of that already in this session, uh, then uh, that would that would have a profound impact in our in our battle to fight climate change, and that's something that I'm I'm particularly interested in. And so, how about I pause there and uh, and hand back to you, Florence? <laughs>